This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome our new international listeners, as well as U.S. military personnel who are joining us from remote locations around the world on the Internet. Thank you for being with us again. And I also want to thank the organizers of the G20 Summit and the sponsors of the National Retail Federation for their wonderful hospitality while I was in London and San Diego. My guest during this hour was not only named Emerging Entrepreneur of the Year, but also earned a place on Time Magazine's Top 50 Inventions list. Mr. Jason Lukash will be joining us in just a moment to talk about innovation in America and whether the land of opportunity is alive and well. But before he joins us, let me mention that Lou Cash grew up in Danville, California, and earned his undergraduate degree in managerial economics from the University of California at Davis. One of his first work experiences with, was, was with Jan Sport and Major League Soccer, where he met his current business partner. Uh, his work with Jan Sport required Lou Cash to travel, and while on the road, he found himself looking for a convenient way to listen to music, and it was that search for portable speakers that became the impetus for Lou Cash's first product. Collapsible speakers, which required no external power and were made from recycled materials, which he named Fold and Play. In 2009, along with partner Mike Simzak, Lou Cash formed Origadio, based on the idea of applying origami folding methods to audio speakers. They began small, selling 15 pairs of speakers a day off their website. Then the story goes that the U.S. Marines placed an order for 50,000 units, and that holiday season word spread like wildfire, and they sold out their entire inventory. For those of you who are fans of the television program Shark Tank, you may also remember Lou Cash as the affable entrepreneur who in 2012 successfully won a thumbs up and investment from billionaire Robert Herjavec. Today, Lou Cash's company offers a full suite of products and employs 14 full-time professionals. Origadio has become a living example of just how far a good idea, sound financial management, and a lot of good old-fashioned hard work can go. Today, Lou Cash enthusiastically shares his experiences with other young entrepreneurs and college students who also hope to one day forge their own way in the world. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program an inspiring entrepreneur in Innovator and humanitarian, Mr. Jason Lukash. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Lukash. Uh, thanks for having me. So, in many ways, you embody the American dream. You worked for a major corporation, and then you had a great idea, and on a shoestring, you got it off the ground, and now you have a multi-million dollar a year company. And What's amazing is all of this happened at a time when the U.S. economy was floundering. So, what's the lesson here? Hard work pays off. You know, um, we, I guess, launched in probably the second worst economy in U.S. history in 2009. That's right. So, yeah, we uh, we took a gamble on doing so, but we had a crazy idea, and we decided to pursue, you know, this crazy idea a little further and actually see what would happen. And luckily it paid off for us, but it was a lot of hard work and a lot of persistence to get here. So did the fact that the economy was floundering, not only in the United States, but on a global basis, did that have any... Um have any bearing on your decision to do this uh, this startup while you were still working at Jansport, uh, just to test it out, maybe on a part time basis? Yeah, it's exactly what we did. We didn't quit our full time jobs because we didn't know how this was going to do. So, you know, we would work from nine to five at Jansport, and then from like five till like two in the morning on Oregadio each night. And uh, you know, I was living in San Francisco, had a crazy expensive apartment, and uh, didn't know how this was this folding speaker company was going to do. Luckily it took off really quickly, but we had that financial security of our full-time jobs. And, you know, we were young too. We were 26. So we didn't have mortgages or any like big financial obligations to worry about. So yes, it was a gamble, but luckily, you know, we were just smart about our decisions to not leave our full-time jobs to, you know, go on a whim and do this. So is that something that you recommend to young entrepreneurs? Like, go ahead and put some of your own money into it and alpha test the concept before you just jump out of your own uh, full-time jobs? Yeah, that's exactly what I say. You know, it's like a lot of people have, like, 
really great ideas for products, but it's the people that actually go out and take a gamble on it, you know, are really the ones that succeed or they fail. But big deal, like if you put in some of your money and if you're young and you don't have to like, you know, put a second mortgage on your house for it, like there's no harm in trying, right? The worst thing that can happen is you fail, but if you fail, just get up and try it again. That's right. I think there's a lot to be said failing when you're young, when there's less at stake. I mean, there's hardly any downside when you're young. You're not supporting a family. You don't have a mortgage. Uh, you can you can afford to put a little of your capital in and, and go ahead and make a run at it. Um, and I, I also believe there's something to be said about um, starting a company with limited resources and capital. You know, I started my company with $5,000 of my own money in the 90s, and it, it really forced me into prioritizing and making a lot of really difficult decisions by necessity. And then years later, when I compared my experience with ventures that received boatloads of venture capital on the front end, it made me realize that growing slower and self-funding along the way allows you to grow in a more stable and sustainable way. So how about you? Was was that your experience? Yeah. And, you know, like we, yes, we went on the show Shark Tank and we got an investment on air, but we never took that investment in real life. We've never raised outside capital whatsoever. We went on Shark Tank solely for publicity. Um, I'm a marketing guy. Mike's a marketing guy. Two marketing guys own a speaker company. One, you had the opportunity to go on national primetime television on a Friday night. Of course, you're going to take up that opportunity. So we made a deal on air with Rob, but we never took it in real life. So in doing so, we've held on to control and equity um, for as long as possible because once you give up that equity or take out that investment, it's really, really hard to take it back. So that's a lot of uh, you know information I pass along to entrepreneurs is hold on for as long as possible until you really, really, really need it. And then, you know, look at taking outside investors. So at the time you went on Shark Tank, did you own 100% of your company? Correct. And how about today? Uh, yeah, still. Um, we, Mike and I are 50-50 partners, so we own 50% of Oregadio. Right, but, you, but you've maintained 100% ownership of your company. So what about those who say at some point, in order to really expand, you have to be properly capitalized, and as long as you're not giving up control of your company, why not give up a certain percent in, in exchange for that capitalization? What do you say to them? I agree. You know, like um, in order to succeed, like if you have a really hot product and you believe in it and you believe it'll do well, you can bootstrap it along the way, right? So we've uh, negotiated like really good payment terms with a lot of our vendors where we'll accept like a 50% deposit on orders that pretty much float the whole production cost of the order and then everything on top of that is profit afterwards. So if you can get creative with the ways that you structure financing deals, you won't need to take outside capital, you know, um, until you really, really have huge orders. For example, we got a half a million dollar order last year and we needed to get about a $300,000 cash in two weeks. So we took an outside uh, investment, but just in the form of a promissory note. We knew we would only need the cash for 90 days, so we offered a really, really high interest rate on it to the, you know, the person that lent us the money. Um, but we didn't give up equity in doing so. So there's other ways to finance orders and, you know, invest investments um, for like, you know, capital purchases, but without having to give up equity. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people ignore the sort of time-honored way of raising capital through cash management, where you're taking deposits on the front end and you're pushing out vendor payments as long as possible so that you've got that cash flow. Uh, And a lot of times uh, with smaller um, startups, you can really raise the capital by just uh, very, very um, judicious cash flow management practices. And I think that that gets overlooked a lot. People think they just got to go out and get a big check. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Now, we're going to have to take a short commercial break. When we come back, uh, we're going to find out whether Lou Cash has encountered any knockoff products and what his response to that has been. You're listening to the Costa Report.
This Legal Minute is brought to you by Nolan, Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Experienced attorneys providing professional legal services to the Central Coast for 85 years. Hello, this is attorney Stephen Wagner with your Legal Minute. Have you ever said to yourself there ought to be a law for that? Well, often there is. In this segment, I will address the issue of social media and hiring practices, and specifically the potential employer's right to snoop around in social media networks to gather information about the potential employee. From the employer's perspective, social networking sites must seem like a treasure trove or petri dish, overflowing with valuable information. The hot-button legal issue that has arisen recently relates to the employer's request, or worse yet, demand, for the candidate's password and or username. It is this conduct by the employer that has sparked outcry and controversy based on privacy rights, and this has led to legislation and the enactment of laws that now prohibit employers from making such demands or requests. Such is the case in California and several other states. It would now seem that the lid has been placed back on the Petri dish. However, it is important to note that employers still have a right to access all public information. That is, anything the potential or current employee chooses to share, publish, or make public. In other words, these laws do not protect job seekers from their own stupidity or indiscretions that they decide to gloat about by publishing their escapades on the World Wide Web. So, it seems, that discretion is still the better part of valor. This is Stephen Wagner, and that's your Legal Minute. Brought to you by Nolan Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Selected in 2013 as one of the top law firms in the United States by Martindale Hubble. Hi, this is John Greenhut. If you can have a bright white smile in five minutes, would I get your attention? Power Swabs is clinically proven to whiten your teeth in five minutes. Power Swabs whitens teeth on average two shades in five minutes and six shades in seven days. To try Power Swabs risk-free, dial 1-800-663-5670. I guarantee your friends will love your movie star white smile. Try it risk-free, 1-800-663-5670. That's 1-800-663-5670. My name is Mickey Phelps here from Crown Cafe and Scotts Valley Market. I just wanted to let you know that Scotts Valley Market has some amazing prices on meat and produce and, of course, throughout the store. Jared and his crew from the meat department will be more than happy to cut a nice filet mignon to your liking. Also, Scotts Valley Market has an amazing hot food bar, and also we make some of the best sandwiches in town, like the Irish. So, folks, come on in and you'll find out that Scotts Valley Market has some amazing everyday deals. Also, at Scotts Valley Market, be sure to look for those yellow tags. That's where you're going to save a lot of money. And we'll be sure that we are very competitive with other grocery stores out there. What makes us different is that we are local and family-owned. So come on in. And while you're there, be sure to ask for Mickey. And don't forget that if you need any catering, give Crown Cafe a call at 831-566-1425. 831-566-1425. Tune in to the Sentinel Radio program Saturday morning at 8 a.m. right here on AM 1080 KSCO. Brought to you by First Church of Christ Scientist Monterey. Come into our Christian Science Community Reading Room and Bookstore and find comfort from the challenges you're facing. We have the resources that will connect you with your God-given substance. Find help now. Our address is 780 Abrego Street in Monterey. Reach out for this help today. Come in and visit or call 831-372-5076. 372-5076. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest is the entrepreneur and founder of Origadio, Mr. Jason Lukash. And before the break, we were talking about creative ways that capital can be raised without giving up equity and how often startups can begin as a side business until the concept proves itself. With the Internet available as a low-cost distribution and marketing venue, It's easy to start businesses on a part-time basis while continuing to work full-time elsewhere. Although, as you heard Mr. Lukash say, uh, that may mean that you you leave your job at 5 o'clock and your other job starts from 6 till 2 in the morning. And and my hat's off to all entrepreneurs that are listening today that are in that circumstance because... uh, because it's it's a rough road. It really is. So let me ask you if if you've noticed any lower quality knockoff showing up on the internet. And if so, what's your response to that, Ben? Yeah, we've seen knockoffs. I learned early on 
people don't knock off bad products. So if someone's knocking you off, you're doing something right, right? Right. Uh, so, yeah, we have seen some similar like type of like vibration speakers and speakers on the market, but we're always constantly evolving as a company. So we try to, we've put out, for example, three generations of the Rocket, which is our most popular product in a year and a half. So we're constantly evolving. So even if competition is knocking us off or doing something, you know, to look like us, we're always one step ahead of the game. So we get pretty creative on how we do that, but we're also smart and clever in doing so. So what do you say when distributors come to you and they say, well, we, listen, we can get this other cheap knockoff for half the price? It, I, the reason I bring this up is my brother's an entrepreneur, and he started a business of uh, developing safety equipment for uh, four-wheel drive off-road vehicles. And uh, and he got really depressed. He used to be a vice president of uh, R&D at Fairchild and also at Lamb Research, and then he went off on his own. And within a year, there were knockoffs all over the Internet. And he said, it's so depressing to have a great idea, struggle, develop a company, be really profitable, and then to see all this junk proliferating and you know you there's something in you that knows you can't stop it. Yeah, you know, like we tell a lot of distributors that they can get a uh, product from, you know, the competitive product that they really want to. But nine times out of ten, they come back to us because the quality isn't there. We strive on quality. Um, You might pay a little more to get stuff from us, but I guarantee they'd be happy in the long term. You know, we offer warranties on our product. We stand behind our product. A lot of these Chinese manufacturers, when you just buy products from them, they take your money and that's it. If you have problems down the road, you can't go back to them and have them fix it. So a lot of people appreciate our brand. And we have that reputation and the marketing, like, you know, behind us where people want products with our name on it. So it's only going to sell, you know, 10 times better. So the branding is where, and, and, you know, you and your partner are both uh, uh, marketing experts. So branding makes a big difference. Service makes a big difference. How about patent protection? Yeah, I mean, we've designed patents on our products. Um, we have two utility patents and process that too, but as we all know, design patents are kind of worthless, you know. Uh, we just do it more or less to protect our design. If someone infringes on them, we'll send a cease and desist letter over. Um, but they're not that all important. I mean, the transducer that's in the rocket was patented over 80 years ago, so we just have a design patent on the shape, um, you know, and but not the functionality of it. Right. So you feel if you're always offering a superior quality and it's backed by reliable service and consistency, that uh, going after patent infringements is kind of a losing battle? Correct. Yeah. It's, no one's going to you know litigate it. You know, a design patent is not worth it. Um, but if you have that quality and that customer service and that high level of like you know, top-notch marketing behind it, people will come to you. So what, in your view, is the most important factor that separates successful entrepreneurs from the vast majority which don't make it? I think it's more like that will. You know, like to be an entrepreneur, you have to gamble, right? It's You never know if your ideas are going to pay off. There's so many people that come to me with great ideas for great products, but the only ones that ever succeed are the ones that go out and try. You know, you don't want to be that person, uh, you know, that tells your friend, I had the best idea for a product yesterday, and then be sitting on the couch five years later, see that same product on TV and, you know, turn in to your friend and say, remember when I had the idea for that product? It's like the best dreams make the best businesses. So the people that go out and actually try it are the ones that are going to be successful. But that's everybody. Everybody I run into has got can't wait to tell me about some product idea, some invention, worse yet, some screenplay that they're thinking of writing. You know, everybody's got an idea, and and yet uh, very few people uh, can see how little risk there's involved in going ahead and trying it out. Well, what, why do they create such imaginary hurdles? Do you think? I think people are just scared. People are scared of like going out and doing things on their own. You know, like, yes, so many people have great ideas for products, I'd say, but only probably under 5% of them actually try to make that product. A lot of people, I think, are just set in their ways and, you know, have their like big lucrative jobs and their corporate salaries behind it and don't want to take out a risk and gamble on something. You know, it's the entrepreneurs are gamblers. So it's, the true entrepreneurs are the ones that are actually going to go out and do their ideas. I think otherwise people will just sit back and keep thinking of their ideas, but they're never going to be an entrepreneur. Now, it's, it's interesting when I talk to people and say, well, go out, give your idea a chance. 
they always think that eventually they're going to have to form a company, hire people. They, they, they're they nervous about whether they have the expertise to do that. But frequently, if you prove your concept, somebody will want to come along and license it or private label it. Um, did that happen to you? Did you get approached by people who said, you know, why do your own company? Why don't you just give us the idea and we'll we'll make it for you and you'll get a royalty? Yeah, we've got that a lot. Um, but I think there's something genuine in doing it yourself and, you know, having product out there on shelves that you've created and your names on it instead of, you know, a competitor's or, you know, a licensee's name. Um, I think people just appreciate that. Like, that's what America is built on. It's like hard work and strong work ethic, you know, and that's what we strive on here at Origadio. We we could license our stuff out, but we'd rather make it ourselves, work a little harder, but see the end result and do it so. But you certainly reduce a lot of the risk if you allow somebody else to manufacture and distribute it and you're just collecting royalties, right? Yeah, but you also give up a lot of that control. You know, if they're manufacturing it and producing it, like it could not be way, be made the way that you want it to be. You know, it's up to them to figure out if, how they want to make it. It's up to them to figure out how to get on retail shelves. Doing it yourself, you have all that control. So I'd rather, you know, make it more money with a higher risk, but also have that control. So it sounds like when we talk about giving up equity and we talk about licensing opportunities, that what it really boils down to is if you want to stand behind your product and you want to control how it's designed, how it's manufactured, how it's priced, uh, where your product line is going, you got to be careful about who you partner up with. Yeah, and that's, I mean, part of the reason why we didn't take the money from Rob Perchevec. There's nothing against the guy. He's a very smart tech billionaire, but I mean, we can get money from anyone if we really wanted to. We get approached all the time with people wanting to invest in our company, but if we were to take an investment for someone, it would be a very strategic decision. We wouldn't just take money from the next person on the street. We'd want to take money from someone that's actually going to help get us in retail or help us with the product development or, or help us with their connections. So, you so know, they have to have more than money. They're, they're, money isn't enough. They've got to show that they can help you grow your company in the way that you want to grow it. Correct. Yeah, it's not always about the money. It's about the relationships. And uh, w- was the investor at Shark Tank not able to do that? Was he not able to open up anything that was interesting to you? Uh, not off the bat. And we decided it wasn't the right course you know, for us to take in our business because he's invested in probably – a hundred different companies between doing Shark Tank and Dragons and uh, owning his own VC firm. So right. we didn't want to just be another number. We wanted to be you know, aligned with an investor that's actually going to help and get out there and push for us each day. That's a very good point. Uh, we have to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk about an issue that uh, so many inventors struggle with and have written to me in advance of this interview. Funding, funding, funding. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes, from salads to desserts and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouthwatering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad, or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berrylicious dish. I've been talking about Sleep Number for a while now and how much I love my bed. My goodness, it's made such a tremendous difference in the way both Celeste and I sleep. My Sleep Number bed is up there around 100. I like it nice and firm. Celeste, 80 or so. What's great about the people at Sleep Number, they're always looking for ways to improve the way we sleep, and they've done it again with a memory foam bed. The all-new Sleep Number memory foam bed is a perfect combination of cool contouring foam and the unique adjustability of the Sleep Number bed. 
dual air technology. That's what makes their memory foam bed unique. At the heart of the mattress are two individually adjustable air chambers that allow you to personalize your comfort. It's memory foam redefined. You only get this bed at a Sleep Number store. You can enjoy introductory savings of $400 on the all-new Sleep Number memory foam bed. And right now, during their white sale, you can stock up and save on their exclusive bedding collection. There are 400 Sleep Number stores nationwide, but the one you want is on 41st Avenue in Capitola Mall. Say hello to Carlos, the store manager, and be sure and tell him that Charlie Friedman from the Happy Hour program on KSCO is the one who sent you down. Hi, I'm Lynn Actenberg, and Project Purr is offering free spay-neuter for feral cats to all residents of Santa Cruz County from now through the end of September. Visit us at projectpur.org or call 423-MEOW. Feeding a stray cat? See too many kittens? Take the next step. Visit us at projectpur.org or call 423-MEOW. Help our community become safe, healthy, happy, and humane for feral cats and kittens. Thanks. Mr. Mom here. Do you have shy kids, introverts? I adopted three. On Friday, I'll share some handy Mr. Mom parenting tips and discuss the best-selling book, Quiet, with clinical psychologist Ariane Dorsey. You'll learn two things. One, anyone who uses Mr. Mom's parenting tips should be reported to social services. And two, being an introvert is cool. Friday at 7 o'clock p.m. on KSCO. For the last 60 years, Coast Paper and Supply has been serving locals and businesses for all their cleaning and paper supply needs. With an 1,800-square-foot showroom and nearly 5,000 products, you'll find everything you're looking for in the way of janitorial supplies, retail and industrial packaging, and disposable food service products for business or home. Not to mention their huge selection of boxes and shipping supplies. Their family-owned and operated business is located at 151 Josephine on River Street in Santa Cruz. Call 831-423-3350 or visit Coast Paper Supply Inc.com, a proud member of Think Local First. Michael Olson's second law of the food chain. The farther we go from the source of our food, the less control we have over what's in our food. Now that so much of our food comes from thousands of miles away, we should all get together Saturday at 9 a.m. as the Food Chain Radio Show tracks down who is putting what in our food. If you have a comment about the second law of the food chain, tell me. Michael Olson, all about it at MetroFarm.com. Now, see you all on KSEO Saturday at 9 a.m. for some What's Eating What Radio on the food chain. What day was that? Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is founder of Origadio and was named Entrepreneur of the Year, Mr. Jason Lukash. And before we took our break, we were discussing the control you give up when you sell equity for funding and even when you make the decision to lower your risk by licensing your inventions to larger companies who have existing manufacturing and distribution in place. Um, so what do you say to folks who uh, aren't building low-cost consumer products and they claim that capitalization is their, is their big issue? I mean, what advice would you give them on how to get their ideas off the ground? I think, like, Kickstarter is actually, like, a really, really good tool um, for, you know, a lot of people launching products, especially if it's a higher-priced product. I've seen some really successful campaigns on Kickstarter. It's a really good tool to, you know... So t- tell us about money. Kickstarter so my, my audience might not be familiar with it. Oh, sure. Yeah, so Kickstarter is a cool crowdfunding site for launching products. Um, so, say, for example, um, the most successful Kickstarter campaign ever was the Pebble Watch. It's a, it's a watch that uh, uses e-ink technology. And um, a couple of guys have this idea for this watch, launched it on Kickstarter, and people pretty much pre-order or as they call in the Kickstarter community, back a product they like. So saying, for example, you could uh, back and donate $100 towards the, their campaign to build this product, and by doing so, you get a watch. Or you could donate $25, and you could get a T-shirt. Um, there's different levels for each product, but it's a cool way from a company standpoint to get a lot of pre-orders and a lot of buzz going before a product actually launches. So I recommend a lot of people to do the crowdfunding approach um, because you're not giving up equity. You're getting pre-orders on products and you're forecasting demand in doing so. So you're getting small contributions by large numbers of people, uh, similar to how Obama got elected, right? You're using the Internet for its, its, uh, its, its best purpose, which is to reach out to lots of people um, and get co- smaller contributions. And these are just advanced orders where people are saying, I like that product, I believe in that product, and I'm going to pay you up front, and when the product's done, send it to me. So what happens if you don't raise enough money to develop the product? 
So if you don't raise enough money to develop a product, you don't get any money. So, for example, if I wanted to raise $100,000 and I needed $100,000 to do tooling and, you know, produce my product, I'd probably ask for like 50000 just to ensure that I hit my goal because it's better to get some money instead of no money. Um, and Kickstarter is pretty cool cool where they only uh, they take five percent of all the funds raised if you meet your goal so yes they're actually probably the best business to be in but it's you know it's a good opportunity for entrepreneurs to get the product out there on a grand scale of course we're always assuming that the entrepreneur knows how much they need to get the product out the door (laughs) right and if you don't you shouldn't build it right? right well there's that whole veracity problem on the internet isn't it I mean, somebody's got to put a reasonable business plan up there, and it's got to make sense. Otherwise, don't rush in and buy a pretty rendering of a product. That would be my advice. You know, when I was starting my business, uh, I found this entire small business loan process to be really time-consuming and bureaucratic, and and it wasn't very useful. Um, Is that in other systems that we have that are non-Internet, that are are not Kickstarter, the kinds of programs the government's put in place uh, for small businesses to get funding, um, do those look like they're just sort of running behind the times? And, And what can the government do to make it easier for entrepreneurs to strike out on their own? Yeah, so it's really a pain in the rear. Um, we and we haven't done it for that exact reason. We haven't gone for an SBA loan. We haven't gone for a lot of like government funded things, mostly because there's so much work involved. Like you, were they're, they're really a waste of time. I want everyone listening out here to to really hear you because I found them to be the biggest time sink in the world. Yeah, they suck, um, and we don't want to do it because of that. It's, so much work and effort and you don't even find out right away if you're actually even going to get it you know it takes months and months and months we don't like doing anything with the government if we don't have to um it's a paying our taxes that's the only thing we really care about it's just because it's not convenient you know it's not streamlined it's all old school methods of doing it like the government needs to like get more up to date like more clever with their marketing like position themselves like they want to help small businesses and actually care instead of making it more of a burden on people to get money so what would you do if you were an elected official uh, in the state of California and they said, listen, give us a couple of ideas here on how we could get uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs funded easily, quickly, uh, give them some seed capital so that we could really be birthing new ideas right and left? Because we've always been a- ahead of the rest of the world in terms of innovation, but we're not, we're not, a, uh, we're not paying attention to that. Yeah, Thank you. I think the connotation with a lot of younger people and with younger entrepreneurs is the government's not cool, right? They don't position themselves as cool. They're old and boring. and It's a lot of older people that work there. You know, you don't want to associate yourselves with the government. So if I was an elected official, what I would do is probably make a cool campaign to, like, go after some of the young entrepreneurs and say, like, hey, we're here. We're the state of California. We want to help. We want to bring more businesses and more great ideas out of the great state of California. So let's, like, make an online portal an online portal or some kind of cool contest or promotion to help, you know, generate some, you know, great ideas to come out of our great state. Why so, can't the government have a shark tank? Because there's no one cool working in the government. <laughs> I, I don't understand why the state of California doesn't use the shark tank model, right, on uh, on public TV and say, come present your ideas and we're going to provide seed capital for the ones that we like. Uh, if I did, I'd jump on it. You know, a lot of, like, I judge so many, like, private, like, business competitions and private, like, you know, like, business pitch competitions where there's a lot of people doing it already in our state, but all of them are private entities or public or private institutions. It's not anything from, like, the actual state doing it. And But also, I think our state's got bigger issues when it comes to in terms of money. So I don't know. I don't even think they should have the small business loan program. They ought to get rid of that. They ought to use a shark tank type of model, let everybody come in front and present their idea and then decide to make an investment right there. And then you, you, as you walk off, you sign a piece of paper and you, the funds are available to you if you want them. Yeah, I mean, they could make this so streamlined and so easy. Well, don't you think the state of California would probably be one of the first businesses to pitch just to try to get out of the debt that we're in? You would think so. But see, <laughs> this is a reason we need folks like you in government. 
And and it's also the reason that a person like you would never want a job in government. Right. I have no desire to ever work. I completely government. understand that. I feel the same way. I get emails every day and they say, Rebecca, you got to run for office. And I'm all, that's the last job I want because <laughs> once you get into politics, you can't get anything done. At yeah. least from the outside, you can. You can get something uh, done. So, you know, one of, one of America's greatest assets has been innovation. And we see things like 3D printing and space-based solar and breakthroughs in uh, genomics. And, you know, it makes me feel like innovation is, is, a, is still alive. Uh, how about you? Do, you? do you feel optimistic about this new breed of entrepreneurs that you see on the horizon? Or, or do you see a tougher road ahead? No, I, I 100% agree. I think, like, uh, innovation's still on the up and up, you know, like I make it a point in my life to stand behind like all the young entrepreneurs of today and who are the young entrepreneurs of the future because the future is now, right? It's coming up closer and quicker. You know, we're all getting older. It's uh, it's important for me at least to pass along a lot of life lessons and things I've learned at a young age of 29 already to, you know, all these high school and college kids that I speak with just because it's so important. It's so important to like, you know, paint a picture for a younger person deciding what they want to do with their life to be an entrepreneur to you know go out and try their dreams because you know as we get older and as baby boomers get older you only start to rely more and more on the younger generation so i have faith i have faith in the future of america but it's important for you know everyone that's leading america or you know being a leading entrepreneur right now to educate the younger generations I really feel that uh, one of the positive upsides that a very bad economy and difficulty with finding good employment might have is it might force people to think on their own and start businesses on their own. I think to a large extent, the uh, unemployment figures, what they don't reflect are the number of people who have just decided to go it on their own. You know, I, do, I just don't see that that's being recorded right now. But we're going to take our last break. And uh, when we do, uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to continue talking with Jason Lukash. Uh, just after a few brief messages from our sponsors, you're listening to the Costa Report. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars. Now, there's a number of ways you can taste wines at the tasting room. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, we currently have nine different wines on our tasting menu, and we really want it to be an experience where you get to taste the wine that you want to taste. So if you want to taste Pinot, you can really focus your flight around that. If you wanted to focus on the bubbles, we have three different sparklings that will allow you to build your flight that way. Or if you came in and you just wanted to taste one wine, we would uh, have it set up for you to be able to do that as well. Now, what's a flight? A flight is basically a combination of small tastes of different wines. If you wanted to taste all of our different Chardonnays, you could taste the 2007 Chardonnay, the 2008, and the 2009, and we would line you up with an individual taste of each of them. Thank you for being with us again, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca.
Performance Bicycle, the nation's largest cycling retailer, is facing record high inventory levels, and it must be sold. Now through Sunday, it's Performance Bicycle's Red Tag Sale at PerformanceBike.com. Over 1,300 items on sale for every style of riding. Many prices too low to advertise. Red Tag deals on helmets, clothing, parts, accessories, and every bike at PerformanceBike.com is priced to sell now. Plus over 50 doorbusters at 50% off, but only while supplies last. Performance Bicycle's Red Tag Sale. Now through Sunday at PerformanceBike.com. If electricity flows through it, you can save a lot of money by doing it yourself with the help of the experts at Santa Cruz Electronics. Hello, Charlie Friedman here. Listen to the things your friends and neighbors are doing for themselves with the help of Santa Cruz Electronics. Xbox 360 repair. Solar energy kits. Musical Tesla coil. Video output from my home media center. Building a new server. Repairing a student radio station. More RAM and a sound card. DSL line. Network printing, scanning, and faxing for dentists. Replacing antivirus on 12 machines. Wireless network for court reporter agency. Diagnosing sound card problem. Building a 5 kilowatt amplifier. Ham radio antenna. If electricity flows through it, you can save a lot of money by doing it yourself with the help of the experts at Santa Cruz Electronics. Voted best electronics store two years running. Call Santa Cruz Electronics today at 831-479-5444 or visit at 2808 SoCal Avenue in Santa Cruz. Do it yourself and save money with the help of Santa Santa Cruz Electronics. Dave Allen here. Remember this. Sunday is 4 p.m. for an array of different world acclaimed eclectic esoteric conversation and guests. Every Sunday at 4 p.m. right here on AM KSU and realize why. I'm not going nowhere. I've got to stay. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Jason Lukesh. So let's talk more about uh, Auric Audio. Um, you started out with one product, and I believe I read that you're up to nine offerings. Is that right? Yeah, we have nine products now. So talk to us a little bit about the expansion of that product line and how that went. So we started with just our folding speakers. Uh, we, you know, were traveling a lot for our old jobs and wanted to create some cool portable speakers that didn't take up a lot of room in your suitcase. So we came out with our first product, which are fold and play recycled speakers. And then, you know, we kept looking to make the latest and greatest. Um, but our differentiator in the market is we can make desktop speakers or normal speakers all day if we really wanted to, but why be like everyone else when you can be different? So all of our speakers are different and have unique features, whether you can upload your own pictures and custom print them on a set of headphones or your own custom speaker, or a product like the Rocket that you can stick to any surface, and whatever it sticks to, it turns the whole object into a speaker. All our stuff is different, and that's where I think we've done really, really well. And you know, Now, you can attach this to any object and turn it into a speaker. How, how does that work? So it's a transducer. So what it does is it sends out vibration sequences, and whatever it attaches to, that then becomes the speaker. So you actually take it, plug into your iPhone, and then put the vibration part on a box, for example, and it'll turn the whole box into a speaker. Or you can stick it on a window and turn your whole window into a speaker. So this, it transfers the sound to the actual object that you're sticking it to. So what's the strangest thing you've seen it attached to? And, and this is a family show. So the coolest <laughs> and strangest thing I've ever seen it stuck to is we took like an aluminum rowboat in Phoenix, Arizona and flipped upside down the rowboat and put the rocket right in the middle and it sounded amazing because if you think about a rowboat, it's kind of built like a speaker, so when we put the rocket right in the middle, it really got super loud and amplified the sound out like for a large amount of space. Wow, so an aluminum rowboat makes a great speaker. (laughs) Correct. I I could see them uh, actually putting rowboats up at uh, rock concerts. (laughs) <laughs> you know, we actually put it on top of, like, a tin roof, too, in Texas, and it, like, sounded like a live concert because it vibrated the whole roof. It was awesome. Yeah, and there's a lot of people that have copper roofs that they could stick it on, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's that's amazing. That really is amazing. And and, and what other kinds of things have you seen them make, turn into speakers? I, I, I can, I can absolutely. absolutely visualize the roofs and the uh, aluminum rowboats. Yeah, like the range that above your stove works really, really well. Um, orange juice containers, cardboard boxes, lampshades, uh, pizza boxes. Um, <laughs> with, 
it's it's crazy. You know, most people when they buy the product, it's only nineteen ninety nine too, so it's not that big of an investment. Right. Most people when they buy the product, they go out and like literally run around their house and stick on everything. <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of cool. So, what do you think it was about that first product that you made that make it take off like it did? Uh, was that the marketing? Uh, it was the marketing, and also um, it was just a cool factor. You know, the folding speakers that we first made, we could have made them out of plastic if we wanted to, but we decided we saw a niche in the market that there was no really eco friendly music devices on the market, so we decided to make them eco friendly as well. So, we kind of hit a two for one and put some really killer press and marketing behind it and really it just blew up instantly i mean three months after we launched it was named time magazine's 50 best events of the year we went some we went from selling 10 speakers a day on our website to over a thousand speakers a day so it's uh yes we got lucky but it was all a lot of like hard work and clever marketing behind it too right so now that the company isn't just uh, two friends selling speakers over the internet at night uh, and it's matured. What do you? What's been the biggest change for you? You know, it's it's hard. It's 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 tough to manage and have a lot of people's lives in your hands, right? So mm-hmm. we have fourteen employees. So it's just before when it was just Mike and I out of a garage. We didn't worry about you know having to pay ourselves large amounts of money. But now that we're supporting fourteen different people's salaries and lives, it's it's scary. You know, it, it's scary. But I guess. Being an entrepreneur, there's a lot of things that are scary and fearful in doing so, but if you're not scared or you, if you don't have fear on a daily basis being an entrepreneur, you're not doing something right. Well, you're not pushing yourself, that's for sure. I have to tell you a funny Correct. story. I think I had maybe 20 employees at you know early on, and one of them came in one day and said, guess what? We just bought a new car, and I freaked out. I, I wanted them to take the car back because I, I wanted them to understand that, look, you know, we're not we may not make it. Of course, you can't say that. But I was thinking to myself, you know, it's day by day, night by night. We're we're slugging it out here. And uh, and you went and bought a new car based on your confidence and faith in our company. And I I, I, I was kind of nervous. And then I realized, well, they're planning to put their kids through college, buy a house. They're making decisions yeah. on whether my my next idea is actually going to pay out or not. And that's a freaky experience. Yeah, for sure. But it also goes to show like they bought that car because they believed in you. So you were doing something right to convince them enough that, you know, they made it seem like they were going to be financially secure. They believed enough in the company. So you as an entrepreneur were doing something right. I, I have to say my biggest asset is that I was worried all the time. Yeah. I mean, you know, I worried. I worried about the people that worked for me. I worried about uh, whether we we were going to have enough market share, uh, whether the, all our products would work. Uh, boy, all a customer had to do was call me up and be unhappy, and I was like sending them everything free I could, you know, because yeah. uh, I just didn't want that out there because I know how contagious and infectious a bad customer is. Yeah, we strive ourselves on having like that really like top notch level of customer service because we're not spending money on traditional advertising or marketing. So word of mouth is huge for us. So every bad instance, we try to cover up, not cover up, but you know, remedy with a really great instance. So they tell you know their friends about the great experience they had shopping with Orgadio or using one of our products. It's, it's so important to have a really great customer service, and that's something that we truly believe in. I, I believe in that too because I think if you let an unhappy customer. Uh, just uh, fend for themselves out there, that'll cost you 50 customers. And oh, uh, and your reputation is something that's so fragile. I don't know that everybody understands that. So let me ask you this. Where do you go from here? Are you going to go public? Are you going to expand your offerings, your customers, distribution? What What's next? Yeah, no, not public for sure. I think any entrepreneur that wants to go public doesn't know, you know what they really want to do. Um, so, yeah, we're expanding. We're adding three new products in the next six months. So all in the audio space, and we're also looking at a couple new businesses too. You know, we like the idea of being in audio, and we like doing what we're doing each day. But you also don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So now that our company's up and going, and it kind of runs itself on a daily basis, it's freeing up some more time for myself and my business partner to look and see what else is out there. What is the next greatest and biggest thing? And that's that's a lot of that's got to be a lot of fun. Are you are you thinking about setting up your own Shark Tank and letting people pitch you? <laughs> How about that for an idea? I'm thinking about running for office and having California. (laughs) Now, I know that's not true. 
not true at all. But but I could see that you you might set up a Shark Tank type of thing up in San Francisco and let people come in and pitch you. That could be a lot of fun. I have to believe being a venture capitalist is a is a lot of fun. You get to oh, it would be awesome. I would love to do that someday. And people already do it anyways. You know, we get pitched businesses day in and day out. So. We're already kind of doing it on a daily basis anyways. Why sure. not, you know, have some seed money to give out to? Sure, microloans, you know, but in the United States, microloans will be a little different than India, you know, more than $20. But still, a, a little right. bit of money, I think, even in today's day and age, can go really far. If people are committed and they're willing to, you know, give up their weekends, give up a little nighttime, give up a little sleep maybe, and a little leisure time, uh, it still is possible. Well, we're all out of time, but uh, before we say goodbye, I want to congratulate you on your success, and uh, thank you for taking time to speak to us today. Thank you, Mr. Lukash. Uh, thank you so much for having me. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you'd like to comment on today's program, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We're all over the Internet, so uh, please drop us a line and let us know how you feel about today's show. And if you missed the full interview with Jason Lukash today or General Hayden last week, uh, you can download the program from our website, Apple iTunes and Podbean as well as our new YouTube channel. Uh, I do hope you'll visit that YouTube channel. Boy, my team spent a lot of time uh, uh, putting that together, and uh, I think it's just a, it's a really neat service. You can pick up uh, radio shows and uh, videos, and I have my picks for videos on there, by the way. Uh, all our latest shows are posted for your listening convenience. I also want to remind you that if you haven't ordered your copy of The Watchman's Rattle, please do take a moment right now. Go to our website at RebeccaCosta.com and order your copy. People are always wondering what they can do to stop political gridlock and get the media to start reporting news with integrity like we used to. Uh, And there's one very easy thing you can do. Just buy a book. Because when you do, you fund quality programming like the Costa Report. So do your part. Go to RebeccaCosta.com and order just one book, and you'll be glad you did. And we, we will be thankful for your support. My guest next week is American civil rights lawyer, Miss Gloria Allred. Allred has been at the forefront of high-profile cases involving women's rights, and now she finds herself in the midst of yet another one involving the mayor of San Diego. So don't miss Gloria Allred right here on the Costa Report. Report, the one program you can count on week after week to put principles ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for the second hour of the Costa Report when we hear what you have to say. What does your website do for you? Does it simplify doing business and automate routine tasks? Does it connect with your target audience and bring new business? If you can't answer yes, then you need to contact Sunstar Media. Located on the Monterey Peninsula for over 17 years, Sunstar Media has developed websites for startups, brick-and-mortar stores, to corporations on the stock market. What makes Sunstar different is the customization that goes into every site, tailored to each client's unique needs and vision. Sunstar's experienced pros keep you ahead of the game with their custom-fit development process for website applications that cater to your company's specific needs. Learn more at sunstarmedia.com. Mention you heard this ad on the Rebecca Costa Show and get a free web analysis report on your current site or a free web consultation for your next project. Let's discuss how Sunstar can help you. Reach out to us at sunstarmedia.com. It is fun, so get up and go for it. Take the family, take the friends, take the entire neighborhood to the rip-roaring racing fun at Ocean Speedway in Watsonville. Friday night, it's the Mike Cecil Memorial Race with a 100-lap modified main event. We're racing four bangers, American stocks, Bay Area dwarf cards, modifieds, and sport mods. Adults $15, seniors $65 plus for $14, kids $6 to $12 for $12, and a family of four for only $45. Details at OceanSpeedway.com. Ocean Speedway is located at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds, just two miles east of downtown Watsonville on Highway 152. Get up and go for the loud, raucous, rip-roaring racing fun this Friday night at Ocean Speedway.
San Jose to Salinas. Red Hot News Talk, AM 1080, KSCO Santa Cruz.